So tonight we're going to dive into Matthew chapter 6, and uh, as, as I started preparing for this, I realized that we're back in, this is the third lesson on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and I'm kind of faced with the same dilemma that Mike Baldwin had two weeks ago, and that Walter had last week, which is, how do you possibly cover this much rich truth in just 30 minutes? Um, you'll recall that Mike covered the Beatitudes and being salt and light a couple weeks ago. And then last week, Walter addressed Jesus being the fulfillment of the law, and then how Jesus explained the true meaning uh, behind six commandments, like do not murder and do not commit adultery. And in each of these sections, Jesus isn't just giving the people God's law. He's explaining God's law to them. And he's doing it in a way that no one before him has ever done. And what Jesus was teaching was that it's not just about checklists of do's and don'ts and superficial obedience. God does want our obedience. But more than that, he wants something much bigger. He wants our hearts. He wants our obedience to come from the inside outward, not just imposed on the outside while the inside is still corrupt and rotten. And tonight's lesson is no different than those. We have Jesus still teaching on the mountainside and still cha changing our thinking to align with God's truth. This under understanding of God's law and of God himself isn't new. It's as old as the law itself, but it was revolutionary to those who heard it and understood it because it means that our relationship with God is much deeper and much broader than any list of do's and don'ts could ever be. And that actually brings me to my, for my aim tonight, which is God cares more about his children's inner character than their outward appearance. God cares more about his children's inner character than their outward appearance. And I've got three divisions tonight. We're going to go over first division, Matthew 6, 1 through 18, which talks about godly actions. Then we're going to cover Matthew 6, 19 through 24, which covers godly values. And finally, we're going to cover Matthew 6, chapter, verses 25 through 34, which talks to us about godly trust. So there's an old saying, you can fool all the people some of the time, and some of the people all the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. And that old quote was used in political speeches for years and years, and it was attributed to Abraham Lincoln. Um, but interestingly enough, there's no recorded instance of Abraham Lincoln ever speaking or writing the, those, those words. So, so apparently even Lincoln followers believe you can fool all the people all the time. And stuff. But, but we as believers need to realize that it, we should append that old saying to say it really doesn't matter how many people you can fool and when you fool them, because God is never fooled. God sees our hearts. He's never, he, he never believes any of your lies. He never believes the stuff, you, even the ones you tell yourself. God is never fooled. And Jesus warned the Pharisees of this in Luke chapter 16, verse 14. He had just given a parable on money. And verse 14 says, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. And he said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others. But God knows your heart. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. And so armed with the understanding that God sees our inner thoughts and motives as well as our actions, Jesus proceeds to address three areas where we are tempted to put on a false exterior. And those three areas are giving, prayer, and fasting. Now, none of these are bad things, right? Like, like those are all really, really good things. Quite the opposite. But Jesus cautions us in verse 1, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. In other words, if you're doing something, regardless of how wonderful and spiritual it is, enjoy that praise that you get for it, because God's not impressed with it in the least. 
Now this is incredibly impractical by worldly standards. Um, I used to be involved with a secular charity and we had a donor who was obviously just giving when it benefited him image-wise. If there was nobody around, he wasn't giving, and if there was, he was giving in a very showy way. And, and we actually had the discussion of whether we felt like that was right, and we concluded it was. It really didn't matter because we weren't concerned with his heart, and his money was still green, and it still fed just as many people as, as money given with the wrong. So from a secular standpoint, we didn't care. But God's different. First of all, God doesn't need your money. So he wants something way bigger than your money. He wants to be the Lord of your life. He wants your heart. He wants you. John Trapp described it as, oh, let us rather seek to be good rather than seem to be so. And like all things of God, we come to learn that when God's plan differs from the world's, God's plan is actually always better. And God knows that if he has your heart, he has you, and your actions will eventually follow. Um, Thomas Cranmer was the Archbishop of Canterbury in the 1500s, and he summarized the idea like this. What the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. That's like one of my favorite quotes, so I'm going to read it again. What the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. If God doesn't have our heart, and instead we're just checking boxes and appearing to be pious, there's only two possible results. The first is that you live your whole life that way, only to get to heaven and find out that you have no reward for all that activity. And the second is, as Cranmer feared, that because our heart doesn't belong to Christ, our will is weak, and we find ways to rationalize our wants and desires. And because our wants and desires are not aligned with God, we will inevitably rationalize our actions, however ungodly and wicked they may be. And we've heard all heard instances of this, right? Like, yes, I abandoned my family, but God wants me to be happy. Or, yes, I cheated this person, but they had it coming. Look what they did. And so we've all heard these rationalizations before, both from others and sadly sometimes from ourselves. We can all rationalize things if, if our heart is out of alignment with God. So if you really want to be obedient, lose the checklist and align your heart with the thinking and your thinking with God. And how do you do that? First and foremost, you have to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. No one is going to be good enough on their own. And then from that point, it's, it's really the whole sanctification process, right? Like, it's staying in God's word, it's daily prayer, it's asking him to show you where your heart isn't aligned with him. And it's an ongoing process. This side of perfection, you aren't going to nail it every time. And the challenge you're going to wrestle with for the rest of your life is that you're gonna keep chipping away at those imperfections, this side of heaven. But the encouragement is that you have a savior who forgives sins and he also helps you change. The fact that you've had this weakness for years doesn't mean that you'll have it tomorrow. God is the li in the life-changing business, and in spite of how it seems sometimes, business is good. So that's kind of a in long-winded introduction to our first division tonight. And with that introduction, I'll go ahead and give you our first principle tonight, which is God cares about our motives. After all these elaborate quotes and everything, I have a really simple principle. God cares about our motives. So let's see Jesus apply this principle to three areas tonight. First, in giving. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So if you're going to give, give because it pleases God, not because it impresses people. Charles Spurgeon said, keep the things so secret that even you yourself are hardly aware that you are doing anything at all praiseworthy. Let God be present and you will have enough of an audience. I love that last sentence, let God be present and you will have enough of an audience. 
Now this doesn't mean that you need to run around and hide your giving in offshore accounts and, and do crazy things to, to take it, to, to be legalistic about it. But if you're tempted by the praise of others, if, if you're a guy who, who actually likes those, those attaboys when, when you give, ah, you know what, maybe you are a guy who needs to give online and to give anonymously so that folks don't see it. Um, and, and you know, just like the alcoholic needs to stay out of the bar, maybe you need to keep your giving secret and kind of on the down low to avoid the temptation until God strengthens you in this area. Remember, God cares about our motives, right? So, so next he spoke about prayer. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So same principle as giving. If you like to put on a big show, and you like to hear how, how eloquently you prayed and how beautiful your prayers are, here's your reward. That's your reward, right? Um, now, Jesus isn't telling you never to pray in public. Jesus himself prayed in public. But your prayer shouldn't be because you are in public. Uh, prayer is just talking to God. And as Spurgeon said about giving God, about giving, God is the only audience you need. If you feel that you need a bigger audience than that, then yes, you're probably someone who needs to do their praying in private for a while until you get this area straight. Imagine if you and I were here in the church and you refuse to talk to me. You just sit there and ignore me the whole time. And then, after a while, a crowd comes in, and all of a sudden you start talking to me loudly in your most holy church voice. Oh, Mike, you're my best friend ever. I so appreciate you. And I, I mean, first of all, I think you were kind of a nut, right? <laughs> but second, I would think you cared more about what the crowd thought than, than what I thought. So why would, you think, why would you think that God would think any different? God cares about our motives. Now, I realize that there is way more in these sections on prayer than, than just this, right? Like, Jesus gives a model for our prayers in verses 9 through 13. He gives us the Lord's Prayer. And note that it's a model for how our prayers are supposed to be structured, not something to be memorized and repeated mindlessly, which is ironic that people do that, right? Because he warns us about two verses prior not to do that, and then, and then we still do it sometimes. Um, and he also addresses the importance of forgiving others if we're to stay in fellowship with them. So there's just tons of meaning here. And when I read these section, this section on prayer, I was like, oh my goodness, I don't know. I need to find somebody with a really succinct kind of summary of this. So I have all these places I go to and research when I'm preparing for lecture. And so I went to one of them that's my favorite, and it's a collection of, of sermons that you can listen to. And I'm like, I'll go see him, see what he's got on prayer. Um, there were 13 hours of teaching on these sections, on these verses on prayer. And I'm like, no, they're not going to go for that on Monday night, I know. So, uh, so, so I get, so if you tell me, gosh, Mike, there was so much rich stuff there, and I feel like you didn't touch and stuff, I get it. You're right, there is. Um, we're going to stick to our main principle tonight, that God cares about our motives, and, and that's what we're going to cover on prayer. But I would encourage you, read the notes on this section on prayer, and also, if you have interest, there's wonderful resources out there. So there's a lot more meat you can get under this section, but we're not going to do it with me getting you out of here at 8.30 tonight. So um, the last exemp example Jesus gave us is fasting. People today don't generally fast as much for religious reasons, so I wanted to kind of briefly clarify what we're talking about. This isn't fasting for medical reasons and it's not fasting for dietary reasons. This is abstaining from food with the intention of humbling yourself before God and focusing on your prayers to him. Public fasting is, I thought this was really interesting, public fasting is only commanded by scripture in one instance, and that's in Leviticus 16 where God provides the activities for the Day of Atonement. Other than that, fasting is a very personal thing. It's a wonderful tool, it's available to all of us, um, but it's personal. It's not something that we do as a community or as a group. A group of us can decide to fast together. But anyway, 
But interestingly enough, the Pharisees had decided that they would kind of demonstrate their holiness by fasting twice a week. So scripture didn't command a fast twice a week, but they did. Um, and all indications is that they were quite proud of it and quite showy about it. In Jesus' parable in Luke 18 about the proud Pharisee and the lowly tax collector, the Pharisee boasts, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. So he was really proud of the fact that he fasted twice a week and he wanted everybody to know about it, right? As you can imagine, Jesus was not amused. So in this section, Jesus says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. It's the same principle, right? In all three examples, giving, prayer, and now fasting. If you do stuff to impress people, that's your reward. Impressing people is the only reward you're gonna get. God doesn't, if you're not doing it for God, God's not gonna reward you for it. So, so I would ask you tonight, how would you apply this principle to your life? What are you more concerned about your appearance than your heart? Where are you more concerned about your appearance than your heart? And if everyone around you truly knew your heart, as God does, would they still be impressed or would they be shocked? So on to our second division tonight. We talked about, so all that kind of talks about God, what true godly actions are and the motives. Now we're going to talk about godly values. And we're going to have to jet through these next divisions, but don't panic. They, they are quicker. What am I doing? Eh, eh, I should get there. Um, so God wants truth and godliness in our actions, right? We just covered that. He also wants truth and godliness in our values. He wants us, he wants to be at the center of what we view as precious, and he wants us to think of eternal value. And in verse 19, he says, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So there's a lot of shiny things in, in this world that can be e really enticing. And I think as men, I think that we have a carnal man that we have to wrestle with that wants to conquer and to possess. Um, but Jesus is telling us to stop and think. Use your brain here. Worldly wealth is going to waste away, but heavenly wealth will last forever. If we have that eternal perspective, you realize that chasing worldly things is foolish. Jesus goes on to warn, no one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, I think it's important to note here that Jesus isn't saying here that having money is wrong. He's saying that serving money is wrong. If you have earthly wealth and it doesn't hinder your pursuit of heavenly treasure, it can be fine. I work with somebody who I would say is a great example of this. He uses his wealth to pursue worldly treasure. But it's a tricky situation and there are lots of pitfalls to avoid. I think that if you're going to do it successfully, you need to be very intentional about it. And you also need to be very diligent to look for the pitfalls. I talked to him a little bit before this lecture, and he said he worries about this all the time. He has a constant check on his heart to make sure that he isn't in love with his wealth. And, and it's part of the burden of having that wealth. He, you know, and so he's very intentional about it. So how do you know if you're serving God or money? I've always heard to check your calendar and check your checkbook. Um, because if you can figure out where you're investing your time and where you're investing your money, it's probably where your heart is. We're all busy, but do you feel imposed upon by things that, are, that offer kind of eternal benefits but no earthly reward? Is giving difficult for you? Do you experience joy or frustration at the thought of giving or serving? Each one of us needs to examine our own hearts, but there are good questions to start with. And actually, one of the best I heard, like it's interesting, I was just driving to lunch this past week, 
and the guy on the radio was talking and he used an example that I'm like, okay, well, I'm stealing that. Um, if you have two adult children and you receive letters from the two of them, both in the same day, and the first one says, Dad, everything's going great. I got a big promotion at work, the kids are doing great in school, and we all love the new house and we, that we just moved into. Life is super good and super busy, so we really don't have time for Bible study or church anymore, but everything's going great. And the second letter says, Dad, you know I got laid off from work last month, and with my wife being sick, it's hard for me to invest a ton of time in finding a new job. The bank's talking about foreclosing on the house, but listen, we're praying about this every day. We're taking it to God, and we're praying for help here, and he's got this, we're good, don't worry about us. So which of those two letters keeps you up at night and keeps you worrying? Which of those children are you the most concerned with that evening? And, and if you think about that, that can count, that's a question that can point you in. So there are all of these questions that we should be, you know, keep prodding yourself, keep checking yourself. Do I have a blind spot? Do I have, a, do I have something there where I'm kind of secretly holding on to worldly wealth and not, you know, and, then, and I love it more than heavenly? And that brings us to our second principle, which is God wants us to pursue his eternal treasure. God wants us to pursue his eternal treasure. So what's the most important to, thing to you right now? Do your actions and your decisions reflect that? Would your family and friends agree with your answer? So third division, godly trust. And this last division is one that's really near and dear to my heart uh, because I am a reformed control freak. And when you're a control freak, worry is just part of the game, right? Like you have to worry because if you don't take care of things, nobody else will. It took me many years and a lot of prayers to come to the grips with the fact that my being in control was all just an illusion. In the end, only God is truly in control. When we try to wrestle that away from him, it isn't something to be proud of. It's saying that I don't trust him enough with that control. I think that I could do a much better job. And in these verses, Jesus lays out just how ridiculous that is. In verse 25, he tells us, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, or what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? From there he gives examples of how God cares for the birds and the clothes and the lilies, and how much more God loves them, loves you, than loves them. So don't worry about saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So God's saying, don't worry, I'm sovereign. And trust that my plan is good, even when you don't understand it. So does that mean that I should quit worrying and working and just wait for God to drop food in my mouth? No. Of course not. That would be presuming upon God. But it does mean that once I've done my job and been a good steward with the resources for which I have been entrusted, I shouldn't worry because the rest is up to him. I can't control the market if I'm an investor or the weather if I'm a farmer. I can't guarantee the health of my family or the well-being of my church. But I can trust the one who can and seek his blessing, but also Seek his understanding when things don't go as I would want them to go. God's plan is sovereign when I like it and even when I don't. If I believe what I say I believe, God will have my heart, he will be my treasure, and finally he will have my trust. Worry tells me that I'm not there yet. Worry's kind of that signal flare, right? If, you, if I got too much worry in my life, that's a sign that I'm not there yet. Trusting in good times and in bad tells me that I've made that move and I'm aligned with him. Which leads us to our final principle tonight. Loving God 
means replacing worry with trust. Loving God means replacing worry with trust. So who's in control in your life? Loving God means trusting him. Do you trust him with control of everything in your life? Let's pray. Father, thank you for all the gifts that you give us, but especially for, for the gift of scripture and especially tonight for the gift of Matthew chapter six, for your, for your teachings on the Sermon of the Mount. Uh, thank you for explaining the true meaning of, of the law. Thank you for helping us to understand what we need to do to apply it to our lives. I pray for each of the men here. Have your hand on them. Help them to apply your truths to their lives. Help each of us to look for areas in our life where we're still clinging to worldly treasure. And help us to kind of turn our focus always towards you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, gentlemen. Help me remember what's next week. Fellowship. Fellowship. Right, right. All right. See you then.